Good morning. Good morning. So we're, uh, yeah, we're doing Song of Songs. When Enoch told me that we were doing this, I was very excited. Um, when he said it was a love triangle, I was like, yeah, it is. All right. Oh, God. Oh, I, oh, I can't wait. So if I get excited, you know why. But before we start, let's go into a word of prayer, and then we can begin. So let's, uh, let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. God, as we enter into your word today, we ask that we have an encounter and experience with you today. We ask you, Father, that you will draw people to yourself. You will enable people to believe. And I just pray, Lord, that we have an encounter and experience with you in our minds and in our hearts. God, we love you and we thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In junior high, I was invited by a bunch of friends to watch a movie called She's All That. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, I'm not really into romantic comedies, I don't know if I should. But they said, oh, but so-and-so is going, and the girl I liked was going too. So I was like, well, you don't have to ask me twice, I'm there. So She's All That, it's a story about a guy named Zach who makes a bet. He makes a bet that he can make any random girl into the prom queen. He can do it in six weeks. So he has six weeks to make any girl that his friend picks into the prom queen. So his friend, obviously, they're, they're going to pick probably the worst girl. So they pick this girl, and her name is Lainey Boggs. She's this awkward art student. She's like a nerd, a very beautiful nerd. So at first, Zach thinks she's just a bet, but then they fall in love for real. And I'm like, wow. I was like, man, what a beautiful story. And then that Kiss Me song comes on, the Six Men's None the Richer. I'm like, wow. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, wow, this movie gives me hope. It gives me hope for the nerd gets the guy, gets the popular guy. I'm like, oh my gosh. It gave me hope that I could get a girl, that I can get someone popular or whatnot. So it was, it was so good. I left that theater thinking, I need a girlfriend. I need a girlfriend. I, a beautiful nerd, hopefully. It became like my mission. It became my mission in junior high, in high school, to get romance into my life. So this was the beginning of my liaison into romantic comedies and my need for romance. That to this day, to this day, I'm already married. I've been married for almost 15 years. To this day, I still enjoy. I still, my heart still flutters when I watch these romantic comedies. Man, even shows. You know, I was watching that Glory show, that Korean show. Has anyone watched that show? So good. It's a revenge show. And my wife, while we were watching it together, my wife was like, oh, I can't wait. For them to get revenge. But for me, it was the total opposite. I was like, I can't wait till they kiss. Like, why aren't they kissing? It's the last episode. Why can't they kiss in the tent? Like, I keep thinking about these things. Romance. Romance is a huge part of the culture. You see it in our songs. You see it in our movies. There's like this, this need for it. That I need romance or my life will not be fulfilled. We're inundated with, with romance since childhood. You know, just think about your favorite Disney movie. You know, the famous, the old ones, there's always that happily ever after narrative. But we've also seen and experienced that it doesn't happen, it doesn't always happen that way. You don't always, you know, you're, you find someone then you just end up with them forever. Many times we see the exact opposite. 
We see heartbreak. We see pain. That just because people fall in love doesn't mean that they're going to have this great romance. So today, my question is, what makes a great romance? What makes a great romance? Our passage today is from the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Let's read it. Sorry, I'm excited, but let's read it. This is such a great book. It's so, oh, it's, it's in, interesting, okay? So let's read it. Chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. It's up on the screen. If you have your Bibles, please open it. It says this, verse 1. I am a rose of Sharod, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. Let him lead me to the banquet hall, and let his banner over me by, be love. Strengthen me with raisins, refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, his right arm embraces me. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, by the gazelle and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Our passage today gives us two principles for a great romance. Number one, loyalty. Number two, intensity. That these two principles are important to any situation. So if you're young, in your youth, we can prepare for this. We can prepare for it. If you're in a dating relationship, you can cultivate it. If you're married, you can maintain it or try to repair it. If you're single and celibate, these same principles apply to our relationship with God and to a lesser extent to our closest friendships. So my first point is loyalty makes a great romance. I met my first girlfriend in my grade seven drama class. Man, drama class was probably the, the class that I've learned the most. Like even to this day, I probably use everything I learned for a real life, to be honest. Anyone join drama? Just, just some, oh, it's, it's, it's awesome, it's the best. Like there's something about it. So I met my first girlfriend in my drama class. Oh, she was sweet, oh, super sweet. She was an outgoing girl. We became friends, like instant friends. And we would talk on the phone. Like I'd be on my land, landline just talking on the phone with her. And then my mom would come, ah, oh, my mom. She always picks up the phone. She's always like so snoopy stuff. David, I need the phone. I'd be so upset. I'm, like, I'm talking to someone, mom. We didn't have cell phones back then. I guess you can't do that now. But now we would talk. On the phone, we would just talk about what songs we like, what on, songs on the radio and stuff. Oh, and I started to really like her. Oh, I was like, I was smitten, I would say. One day in our drama class, she was sitting super close to me. Like our shoulders were rubbing. I was like, oh. <laughs> Oh boy, she was sitting super close to me. And we were just sit sitting there, and all of a sudden, I felt her head go onto my shoulder. Like, oh. She smells so good. <laughs> she smells like Calgon spray. I was like, oh man. I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I was young, and I was like, What's the etiquette for such a thing? So I just put my head on her head. <laughs> and her hair, oh, it smelled like some hairspray. I was like, oh, man. Eventually, I ask her out, and she says yes. I was over the moon. So over the moon that my imagination and thoughts, you know, went to the future. Oh, I think this girl's the one. I 
think she's the one. I think I'm going to marry her. I can picture it. I can picture it in my head. I can picture marrying her, having kids. And I know I saw it. And I'm honest, honestly, I honestly thought we would be forever. Like, for real. Two weeks later, two weeks later, she tells me she just wants to be friends. I was like, what was all that putting your head on my shoulder bit then? Like, I was like, what? I was devastated. I was devastated. But actually, in the end, I actually ended up marrying her friend in the end. But that's another story. <laughs> but at that time, love sucks. I cannot tell you how many times I listened to 90s R&B. I listened to Boys to Men. There was a song on Bended Knee. And I would be like, huh, I'd be talking to my friends. I'm like, yo, just play the song. And he would just put this, his phone on the, like, the Argetto Blaster kind of thing. And he would just play it. And I'd be like, super sad. Like, I did not date for fun. It was never in my head. I was never all about, oh, let's just casually date. Let's just have fun. I was never. It was more like, date, get married. That's how I thought about things. Love sucks. I was like thinking to myself, no loyalty, no commitment makes for a horrible romantic story. It does. That a great romance requires loyalty. It requires commitment. Of course, you know, there, there is a time to look around. There's a time to weigh options, to take initiative, to, to see. But eventually, eventually you need to make a decision, hopefully the right one. And when we make it, we need to focus on that person. We need to invest into that one relationship to make it great. That's what we see in our Bible passage. If you were here last week, we found out that the story is about a love triangle. It's a love triangle between a young woman, a shepherd, and a king. The woman is trapped in Solomon's bedroom and separated from her true love, which is the shepherd. And while she is trapped, we go to our passage, while she is trapped, she thinks, she's thinking about her true love and probably dreaming about the words she longs to hear from him. Let's read it again. Verse 1 to 3. I am a rose. I think it's Sharon. I, I think. I don't think it's Sharon. It sounds weird, but. Okay, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the young women. Like an apple tree among the trees of the forest is my beloved among the young men. I delight to sit in his shade, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. So the, here the woman is speaking in verse 1. She's like, I'm a flower. I'm like a flower in the wild. Here she's insinuating that she's just another girl that you might pass by. So she's like self-deprecating, probably in a flirtish, flirt, ugh, flirtatious way, okay? Probably in a flirtatious way. It's like, you know, when girls say facetiously, I'm so ugly. But really, they want the guy to tell them that they're pretty. You know, there's some girls that are like, huh, oh, I'm just so ugly. But they want, they want, like, comments from the guy to say that they're pretty. So that's kind of what's happening here. She says, I'm so ugly. So verse 2, the man assures her, you're a lily among the thorns. So thorns meaning the other woman. You're a lily among the thorns. To him, she's the only flower. She's a lily that stands above the rest. He has only eyes for her. 
This seems to energize the woman. She, goes, oh, she says to the man in verse 3, You are the apple tree among the forest. Your fruit is sweet to my taste. Oh my, things are getting, uh, things are getting wild. <laughs> like, like, whoa! But the point is this, that they're strongly committed to each other. They don't want anyone else. The point is to keep our eyes Focus on the right person. To bring out the beauty and excitement in your one relationship. This is a challenge. This is a challenge for like long-term couples. To not let your eyes wander. To not let your eyes wander to other women. To other men. Other people. It's a challenge. To long-term couples that maybe you get too busy, that you neglect your spouse, you neglect your wife, you neglect your husband. Because when you get married, it doesn't mean that romance ends. In all honesty, the longer we're married, the more we have to cultivate that love and romance. And we have to stay disciplined because it's so easy to get complacent. So easy to get complete. I already got the girl. So you don't have to you know, just rest and you're like, oh, I got her already. We get lazy. We start falling into bad habits. So we need to put the work to make things special for your spouse. Let me still try. You know, so many times I talk to some couples, they're like, my husband has stopped trying. You need to put the work to cultivate not just romance, but also friendship. Like, in my opinion, friendship is an underrated pillar in a marriage. Friendship. And I think people don't talk about it enough. Being friends with your spouse. Being friends with them is just as important that you like hanging out with them. Having a thriving friendship is so valuable. This principle also works in our relationship with God and in our friendships. Some of us have become complacent with our relationship with God. Think about this. When was the last time you had a good talk with God? When was the last time you just sat there and was just communing with God? Or have you gone in complacent? We can do this with our friends. When was the last time you had a good conversation with your friends? Where you really asked each other, how are you doing? Sometimes we assume that everyone is just good. We need to continually make it deeper and better all the time. When we commit and invest deeply in each other, that's loyalty. Loyalty makes for a great romance. But there's another thing that makes a romance great, and that leads to my next point. Intensity, guided by love, makes for a great romance. A few years ago, I had a friend who was like madly in love with this girl. Like there's this feelings of intense. You know, you're in, oh, like you're in love. But there were other guys who liked her too. So to impress her, he told me that he bought a gym pass. A gym pass? So, yes, I am going to work out. I am going to work out so much that she is going to fall in love with me. Can you believe that? Can you imagine? Getting a gym pass and you're like pumping your arms, like, can't wait till she sees my chest. Like, it, it, it was interesting to me. But he felt like he needed to look a certain way. That if he got there, 
if you had that, you know, chiseled abs and biceps and stuff, then this girl would like him. So he would go and he would be pumping iron every day with his gym pass, hoping to get those muscles. A few months later, he asked the girl out. But she says no. I don't know why. Maybe his muscles weren't big enough. Who knows? Maybe your triceps weren't showing when you walk. I don't know. He picks another guy, his friend. Oh, God, God, that's the worst. I have to say, that, that sucks. He picks another guy. So, so we meet up, and he's crying. We're like, what the? Well, I'm just kidding. Uh, it happens. It happens. He's crying, and he's bawling his eyes out. And I, honestly, I felt bad for him. But he said he feels so much pressure. You're like, pressure from who? He said he feels so much pressure to be in a relationship, to be in this romantic relationship that he said he wouldn't be complete if he wasn't in one. That his happiness, in a sense, was dependent on a woman. And I'm thinking, oh, I, I get it. But man, to do bench presses for a girl? To do bicep curls for a girl? To do sit-ups for a girl? Hoping to impress? To me, it does not sound freeing at all. It feels like more pressure, to be honest. Pressure that can crush you. But that's love. The thing about love here is that it's a powerful thing. It is a powerful thing. It can make us do wild things. My, oh my goodness, it can make us do wild things. It could be so intense. We see this in our passage. Let's read verse 5 and 7 again. Verse 5, she says, Strengthen me with raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head. His right arm embraces me. This couple's love is so intense. The woman here is overwhelmed. Is so overwhelmed with his love that she's literally about to faint. She said, I need raisins. I don't know why you would need raisins, but she said, I need raisins. She's literally about to faint with love. That this type of intensity is a good thing. Oh, it's, it's a good thing that romance, as intense as it is, is a gift from God. That it's meant to be enjoyed. But, but if our relationships is not healthy, and you rush into the wrong commitments, it can be heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. I know some of us have experienced it. It can be crushing. So in verse 7, the woman issues a, issues a serious warning to all the other women and also to us. She says, Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. It's interesting here that she speaks of a love that can be so intense that it's like alive. We've felt, if you've been in a relationship, you know, at the beginning, you feel it. Like it's, a, oh, like you, you, it's intense, it's alive. It's like a person or an animal that has its own desires and it needs to be respected. And if we are patient, love itself will lead us to the right commitment. The Hebrew word for love here is ahava. And what's crazy, crazy, at least for me, what's crazy is that it's the same word that is used in the greatest commandments. You shall love ahava, the Lord your God, with all your heart. You shall love ahava, your neighbor as yourself. 
It's the same word that this love is the core essence of God's law. So if we follow the way of this love, ahava, then this love will lead us to the right person. It will lead us to the right commitments. So don't rush. Don't rush. I know it's easier said than done. Or, oh my God, I'm attracted to this person. Ah! And you want to, oh, I just want to rush in. I cannot tell you how many times people are like, don't rush into this relationship. Yeah, she's pretty, don't rush. I'm like, no! So I ask her, and then she says, no! And I'm like, oh, what is it? And you're like crying and stuff. Just kidding, I didn't cry. But don't rush. I know we like to compare. I know we like to compare ourselves when you look on social media and Instagram and, oh, everyone's hugging each other. And you're like, oh, it's a red light. they look so happy. I want that. Look, oh, oh, God, I want that. Or maybe you feel pressure from your own family. You're how old? Oh, my, wow, you don't have a girlfriend yet? What Filipino parents say all the time. Where's your girlfriend? I don't know. I don't have one. Like, it's how it is. There's this pressure. Or the culture is pressuring us. If you do not have a romantic relationship, then you are less than. Your life is not fulfilling. So there's a lot of pressure, but we need to listen to the women. Do not awaken love until it's ready until everything you've ever learned about love is telling you to go deeper with that person. Do not, do not awaken love until that relationship is your best expression of love for God, of love for people. We do not think that way. We rarely think that way. But when that moment comes, then you can commit with everything that you've got everything. This is not a casual thing. It's everything. Your time, your energy, your money, your whole self, everything. That's intensity as God has designed it. And it makes for a great romance. As we conclude... Our big question today was, what makes a great romance? Our pastor tells us that we need loyalty, commitment. When we make our final choice, we need to keep our eyes, our heart, our whole selves on this one person. We need to focus on that relationship by working hard. A lot of people think, love should be easy. Ugh, stop it. I had a friend who put on Facebook, he's like, Love should be, shouldn't be this hard. I'm like, stop it. Dislike. Just kidding, I can't even dislike it. It's hard work. If you're going to go into a relationship, it's work. It's hard work. So expect that. We're working hard at building romance and also building a friendship in this relationship. Second, we need an intensity guided by love. A love in the form of love for God and neighbor. We let this love guide us to the right person. And once we know that relationship is based on that love, ahava, then we can commit, commit everything that we've got. Till then, till then, do not awaken love until it's ready. Don't don't rush, relax. Take a deep breath. Let love be your guide. That's how we experience love as God intended. Pray. God, we thank you for your word today. Father, in the world that we live in, we see it in movies, the music that we listen to, just, just the overall culture is inundated 
with romance. Father, help us to realize that romance is your creation, that God, it is a good thing. It's a wonderful gift that you've given us, with Lord, that we need loyalty, we need commitment. We need this intensity that is guided by your love. Father, there are some of us here today that maybe we're in marriages and we kind of just got in complacent. You know, we don't try anymore. Maybe we've been married for a long, long time and we just stopped trying. God, convict us today. Convict us today. Convict me, because I'm in this boat. But I pray, Father, that we will try, we will work hard at cultivating romance and friendship. Father, this love is intense. Some of us here today are in a rush. We feel the pressure, whether it's from family or even just our own expectations, pressures from the culture. Father, as your word say, says, do not awaken or arouse love until it's ready. Father, help us to trust you in that. If we're in that boat, help us to trust you. God, we love you and we lift this day to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.